sit. Now is our opportunity to come together as one and share an intimacy of prayer. So join with me. Father, we thank you for the honor we have to come before you as a family. We think of what we've gone through with the celebration of your birth and what it means and the life that you offer. And now, Lord, you've gone back to your place of glory. And that's why we sing and celebrate and declare praise and honor and worship unto you. For you are at the right hand of the throne of God. In all of your glory, you are so beautiful, Lord. Your face shines with the glory of God. Your eyes blaze like fire. Your hair is white as wool, as white as snow. That's what your word declares. The splendor of your majesty just surrounds you. We praise you, Lord Jesus. But the most beautiful thing are the marks on your hands and your feet. <laughs> For they're the love of God for me. How we praise you. And we come into to the Holy of Holies before the Father. And we know in and of ourselves we cannot be here for we have nothing to offer. It is only because of Christ's love. For you declare us worthy. So we praise you, Father, with all that we are. We lift up your name. We honor you, Father. And the best way we can do that is with your word. So we bow in prayer before you, Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth gets their true name. We ask, Father, in your great glory, give us the power to be strong inwardly through your spirit. We ask that Jesus will live in our hearts through faith, and that our lives will be strong in love and built on love. Father, grant us the power to understand the greatness of Christ's love. How wide, how long, how high and how deep that love is. We know Christ's love is greater than anyone can understand. But help us to know that love more and more. Father, we are created for your pleasure. We're created to reflect and give you glory. And that is our purpose this morning, is to lift you up and honor you. Grant each of us a desire in our hearts to live in obedience to your word, to honor you with our lives. We just praise you this morning. All glory be unto you. We thank you for the opportunity to be called your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme, over all, who rise from the dead. So he is first 
in everything. God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. And at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This next song is a new one, and I hope it blesses you as much as it blesses us. The words are absolutely beautiful. If we get through it without crying, I, that'll be good. So anyway, sing along as you know it or as you figure it out. Do you feel the world is broken?
the strong. The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, is David's ruler, the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever
is open and we can come and celebrate you and remember you. Lord, now we lift up uh, Dr. Kyle as he comes forth to give us your word. I pray, Lord, that he, that he opens his mouth and your spirit speaks through him. And just thank you, Lord, for the people you've placed in this church and how you've equipped different ones to do your will and to serve you because you are so worthy. We thank you and love you, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. I think this is by my count the, uh, I think this is the fourth year in a row I've done the end of the year service. It's getting to be a bad habit, I think, or something. <laughs> So, no, I'm, I'm happy when Dave asks me to fill in when, when he's gone, and uh, appreciate you all listening, and uh, uh, look forward to it every time. You know, I've done quite a few sermons over the years, off and on, and some, sometimes sermons flow really easy, and some are really difficult, and I've had everything in between, but this is one I had no... I had really no ideas going into it when Dave asked me what I wanted to preach on, and I just was a blank slate, and I said, God, just, just put something on my heart. And this was the easiest sermon I've ever jotted down in my life. It, it just flowed. So hopefully hopefully it'll, it'll uh, touch you and, and make some sense and uh, hopefully motivate you and inspire you and, uh, as we go into 2021. Uh, anybody ready for 2020 to be over? Oh, okay. <laughs> a few, a few hands, a few claps. Yeah, actually, I had a good year in 2020. To be truthful, I mean, but I don't, I don't want to say that very loud, much out loud because I know for a lot of people it was a very rough year. Okay, and uh, I think the majority of people are fairly anxious to put 2020 behind them and move on to 2021. But the question at hand is, what is, and the title is, What God Wants Us to Do Until Christ Returns. You know, we, we live in turbulent times, to say the least, right? Um, our very way of life, our freedoms, our security, our comfort levels, and our faith have all been tested in 2020. Have they not? Uh, and anyone with even a moderate amount of Bible knowledge will tell you that we are living in very biblically prophetic times. What the Bible would describe or describes as the end times. Uh, even people, I've had many conversations with patients who I know are not Christians or maybe nominally, nominally, yeah, nominally Christians. And they have really no faith, but they can intuitively sense something's up. Something's up in this world. This is all leading to something. And, and they, they are 
they're a little bit unnerved about it all. Okay? Um, it is a feeling like this is all leading to something very big. You know, as a follower of Christ and as, as fellow followers, we've been looking forward to Christ's return for, what, 2,000 plus years now. And he promised. He promised us that he would return. And when the Bible tells us about a promise, you can mark it down with absolute certainty that it is going to happen. Okay? Fulfilled prophecy is actually one of the best reasons why we can trust the Bible, along with many others. The Bible has literally hundreds of examples of prophecy that has already been fulfilled. And there are several in there that haven't been fulfilled, but the common denominator is if there is a promise made or a prophecy in the Bible, it's going to come to pass. That's the bottom line. Okay? That is the absolute bottom line. <clears throat> While we wait for Christ to return, and especially as we see his return nearing, there are some important jobs that Christ has for us to be doing. So, what I put together is not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of things that Christ wants us to be doing before he returns. But there are some observations from my own thoughts and from Scripture that hopefully will provide some motivation going into 2021. So here it goes. Number one, Scripture is pretty adamant about this. It is meet together regularly as believers. Okay, it's what we're doing here today. But it's meet together regularly as believers. There's a passage in the book of Hebrews, and it says this, And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Especially now. Do you guys realize that we need each other? We do. We, we need each other big time. I get encouraged, recharged, strengthened, fed, and motivated whenever I'm among, in church and amongst my fellow believers. And I see some heads out there shaking in agreement. Sunday school, small groups, singing together, prayer time. Preaching and fellowship are huge parts of my life. And when I don't have that or I miss that, I feel like a part of me is missing. I feel like my week was off, in a sense. <clears throat> when we meet together, we not only soak in all these things I just mentioned, but we are also to be an encouragement to others as well. How does one feel connected to God and God's people through the church? That's the question. How do, you, how do you feel connected? A lot of Christians I know just don't feel connected at church. And they don't feel, they don't feel connected to God and God's people through the church. Um, at least for me, the best way that I have found to be connected is to just flat out be involved. Just be involved. Get it, as many things as you can to be around God's people. That's what I have found. Did you know that God has a special role for each one of us to fulfill in the church? That's why we all need each other. Because we all have something to offer and something to give. So unless we are fulfilling that role, we will feel disconnected and discouraged. Uh, Romans chapter 12 points this out pretty nicely about this part of us being interconnected. It goes like this. Uh, Romans 12, 4 to 8 says, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. 
If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. I don't care who you are, you fit into one of those categories. You're all good at at least one of those things, and so am I. At least one, okay? So I see too many Christians living in fear and disconnected and not plugged in and not serving in any capacity. The major reason is that they are neglecting the aspect of meeting together regularly. So in 2021, make it a goal of yours to get plugged in regularly. Not just for yourself, but for the benefit of others. It'd be a great encouragement. Okay? Number two, occupy until Christ returns. And uh, I don't use the King James Version of the Bible a whole lot, but I like the what it says in the King James Version about this verse. And it says uh, in Luke chapter 19, verse 13, And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. And so occupy really means simply to be about God's business. Be about God's business until the time that he returns. So in the parable here, God or, or the master, he gave each servant some money. And it, it is speaking of money here, but could just as easily read, God gave each person some talent, some opportunity, some gifts, some skills, some knowledge, some wisdom, fill in the blank. What are we going to do to occupy until uh, God, with what God gives us? Are we going to use it in our own pursuits, our desires and schemes, or have all these talents and gifts and opportunities and not use them for anything, or are we going to realize that it all comes from God, all of it, and it all belongs to Him, and to invest it wisely for Him? Are we going to realize that the best investment of our time, talent, and money is to invest it in heavenly treasure? The Bible speaks about heavenly treasure in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. It says, Don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them, and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. It's kind of interesting. So really, the best investment you can make with what God has entrusted to you is in your local church and in the lives of others who God puts in your sphere of influence. God cares about people more than anything. He cares about people. And he wants us to invest everything we got into that. And one of the best ways to impact people is through our local body here. <clears throat> this is going to make an impact on this world for Christ. And you will be storing up treasure for eternity. It's always interesting. People try to get rich in this earth. And I'm probably not allowed. I try to do as well as I can financially. and would be foolish not to. But... Everybody says you can't take it with you from this earth, and that's true, but interestingly, you can pass some on forward, though. You can pass some on forward, and that's what we should be aiming towards, is those heavenly treasures, the, the impact that we make in the lives of other believers and non-believers. That's treasure we can pass on forward, and that's a good investment. Number three. What God wants us to do until Christ returns is to live God holy and godly lives. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 and 12 sum this up nicely. 
since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. So this is how the process works in the life of a Christian. When you put your trust in Christ, you go through a process called justification, big word. In other words, what that really means is just you're made right with God. You are justified. Your sins are forgiven. God looks on you and sees that you're fit for fellowship with him because of the sacrificial blood of Christ. You are adopted into the family and become a son or daughter of Christ. It's a one-time event. You go through this, you get saved, and you get justified. So I was uh, 1987, at the age of 11, I went to a fellowship of Christian athletes basketball camp. And I went there to learn how to develop my basketball skills better. But also a part of that were several godly Christian coaches who shared their testimonies of when and how they trusted in Christ and got saved and got right with him and how God had forgiven their sins. And uh, they shared very simply and straightforward from Scripture of how I could be saved and how I could come to know Christ. And at the, the age of 11... I prayed a prayer from my heart and very earnestly that God would forgive me and that he, and I invite him to be my savior on that day in 1987. And uh, my life has never been the same since. That was the day I was made right with God. I was justified. <clears throat> the problem is, there's a problem though after that. The problem is that you and I, even after we are saved, still have a sin nature, don't we? <laughs> the Apostle Paul does a nice job of describing of what this is like to live with. So, I'm a committed follower of Christ. I want to please Him. I want to serve Him. I want to love Him. And I, I want Him to be happy with me. But yet, doggone it, I mess up. And so do you. And Paul does a nice job of explaining this. So, here he writes in Romans chapter 7, 15 to 19. He says, I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree with the law, that the law is good. So I'm not the one doing wrong. It is the sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I want to do, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Have you ever been frustrated with yourself? Ever had that feeling? Yeah. Uh, 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 with yourself and the way you act? I know I have many times. The good news is that God never gives up on us, does he? He's never given up on me. He is calling us by the power of the Holy Spirit living within us to live godlier and more holy lives. This process is a big word, too. It's called sanctification. <clears throat> and it's a process. We are a work in progress. As we grow and mature in our walk with Christ, over time, some transformation should take place. Our speech should get cleaner, as an example. Anger issues should resolve. Our tongue should be better controlled. Old sinful habits should be kicked to the curb. <clears throat> Our wisdom should increase. 
biblical wisdom. Our love should grow stronger. And people that know you best should be able to see changes happening in, in your life for the good. <clears throat> it is called progressive sanctification. It's progressive holiness. That should be the mark of a believer and a follower of Christ. It might be a couple steps forward and a couple step and a step back, but the trajectory should be progressive holiness and godliness as we mature in our walk with Christ. So the question is, are you and I, are, are we making progress? Did we make some progress in 2020? And do we have plans to make progress in 2021? Are you moving forward or slipping back into your old ways? <clears throat> the life that Christ calls us to is to become more and more like him as we run the Christian race. We do this by daily being in his word, having a vibrant prayer life, and meeting regularly with God's people in his house. Number four. Look forward to and pray for his coming. Look forward to and pray for his coming. If you and I are living godly and holy lives, we should be eagerly awaiting the Lord's return. Eagerly awaiting it. First Corinthians says this, chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all bl blame on the day when our Christ, when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. If you are living for Christ, his return should be something that you're looking forward to. Okay? <clears throat> if you are living as a Christian, doing your own thing and living for yourself, then this is a day you're not likely looking forward to. In fact, you are not likely even giving it much thought as you go through your life. So you, do you want to know what looking forward, anticipating Christ's return does for a believer? See, if you're going through your daily life and you have ups and downs and struggles, but you realize that you're a child of God, you're a son or a daughter, you've been justified, you're working on that sanctification thing, and you know that Christ is going to return, you know what that does for your, yourself inside? It provides real, lasting hope gives you hope that, that can be the fuel that you need to carry on with your day and your weeks, even though some might be very tough. We all need hope in this world. And looking forward to the return of Christ and knowing that it's an ironclad promise provides real and lasting hope. It can be the drive that keeps us going. It takes our focus off of ourselves and onto eternal things. It makes our problems seem smaller. We read this passage already, but in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, it talks about looking forward to the day of God and hurrying, it says the phrase, hurrying it along. It means we should actually be praying for it. Christ's return. In other words, we should be looking forward to Christ's return so much that in part of our prayer life, we actually physically, Lord, please come back soon. Please come back today. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> you know, when we're with Christ, when he raptures the church and we're with Christ for eternity, life will really begin then. Life will be perfect. Life will have purpose and meaning when we are with Christ more so. It will be fulfilled purpose and fulfilled meaning. We will live life with our Savior at that time. So is that something to look forward to? I think so. I think so. 
we should be praying to hasten the day when Christ returns. This too has the effect of turning our minds off of this world and on to the next. So are you and I, are we looking forward to Christ's return? If not, then what do we need to do in our lives to make that a reality? So as we, we wrap this up, here's a few things that I want you to keep in mind. Number one, whether you believe it or not, the return of Christ is as sure as the sunrise. It's going to happen. It is going to happen, and it is going to happen very soon. Are you ready? Are you doing the things that are commanded in Scripture to do while we wait, though? That's the key. If you get so focused on Christ is coming, Christ is coming, but you lose sight of what we need to be doing while we're waiting, you don't want to do that. <clears throat> so in 2021... Plan on, plan on meeting together with fellow believers every chance you get. Occupy or do the Lord's work. Live a holy and godly life. In other words, work on that progressive sanctification that we talk about. Look forward to his return and pray for it. One other thing. So we've already talked about sanctification. We talked about justification. But finally, here's the good stuff. When Christ returns, we will have achieved glorification. We will receive a new body that will be immortal and never die. We will no longer have that sin nature that Paul talked about, that doggone it we just struggle with. We will have no aches. We'll have no pains. Eh? We'll have no tears. There'll be no more suffering. So don't lose sight of the big picture when you get bogged down in life. Don't lose sight of the big picture. You know what? Even if you've never read the Bible, if you go to the last pages of the Bible and read that, if you're a follower of Christ, guess what? You're on the winning side. You're on the winning side. And we will prevail. And we have a glorious, glorious future ahead. So make 2021 a great year by focusing on these things that God wants us to do until Christ returns. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promises from your word. They are, they are ironclad. They, we can be sure of them. And we're so excited, Lord, that Christ is going to soon return. Help us, Lord, to live in light of that fact, to live 2021 as a year when we really look forward to that. And Lord, challenge us in the new year. Equip us. Help us to be worthy followers and servants of you. We ask this in your great name. Amen. Let's rise one more time. and I have found myself using this song a lot lately this year.
as we go forth this week, we're going into darkness lots of times, but bring the light, turn on the switch, and show the world who Jesus is, and keep singing this song. <laughs> 